Thank you very much for taking the time to attend today's presentation on new techniques for identifying macro themes and trade ideas. I've been a venture capitalist for nine years in New York and have published research on origination and elicitation and research techniques in our industry. And I'm going to be sharing some of the technologies and tools that venture capital and private equity investors use that are applicable and I think less used by the public market investor world. Briefly, I'll give a little bit of context and talk about how to identify new macro innovative trends that can create discontinuous change in investment opportunities, alternative analyses and data sets, and more broadly, your information network, and then some next steps. I'm going to start with the most amazing data I've ever seen in the investment research universe. This is a study done of mutual fund managers showing their excess returns when they invest in companies run by companies in which they are in, an, a, in which the management team went to college with a fund manager or graduate school. Uh, in other words, if you invest in a company run by someone who is in your university at the same time as you, you will typically get 840 basis points higher returns. So that is ludicrous. If I could consistently do this, I would be running an extremely large fund but it's a statistically robust result. And it reflects the fact that you get better results when you have better information about the companies in which you invest. If this is true in the very transparent public markets, all the more so is it true in my world in the private markets. No need to take detailed notes. You can get this full slide deck on my website at tetan.com slash macro, M-A-C-R-O. Briefly, my background. I've been a partner at SF Venture Capital and Hoff Capital for the past nine years, two New York-based VC funds. Prior to that, I was a serial founder in the fintech sector with two exits and an investment banker. And I have a particular interest in best practices in the investment research uh, process. And so I'll be sharing some of that today. So let me talk about the seven sources of innovation opportunity, drawing from Peter Drucker's research. So the first four are within the enterprise. They're essentially symptoms of things that are going on outside. Uh, an easy example of that is something that is unexpected. Uh, in my world, a uh, famous example is Soylent, which started as a software company, and the founder on the side started experimenting with alternative foods, meal replacements, because he found it time-consuming to actually cook and clean up, and he started making powdered food equivalents. And that became his core business, and he pivoted from software into food. So he was paying attention to something that was totally off his plan, but actually proved to be a good business opportunity for him. Second is incongruity between your expectations and reality as it actually is. So when Microsoft was developing Windows 10, there was a, a conventional wisdom that tablets were going to make PCs disappear. And they said, no, it's not true. We actually see PC sales are continuing. Tablets are fine, but they're not good for everything. And they designed Windows 10 to reflect that. And that helped to make Windows, or Microsoft more broadly, an extremely successful company. Third is innovation based on process. So Zoom, one of the current stock market darlings, when they initially launched, their sales pitch was, we're a video conferencing company, just like the other 10 competitors, like Google, that are far better uh, placed than us and have far more users, but we're better than they are, right? We're going to be mobile native, we're going to have higher quality. And that seemed like a really laughable investment proposition, but they raised some capital and it seems to have worked out okay for Zoom because they actually imp innovated on the process. Number four is changes in industry structure or market structure. So an example would be new, uh, the use of new web-based technologies to outsource more effectively. Uh, that new technology created a huge opportunity for, example, uh, knowledge process outsourcing, other outsourcing opportunities in India and other lower cost locales for white collar services. Number five is demographics. The great thing about demographics is everyone who economically matters in 2040 is alive today. Uh, and you can look at their race, their age, their demographic, geographic distribution, and make very accurate predictions about what the future holds for them. So, for example, uh, it's a safe prediction that Japan and much of Western Europe is going to get significantly older because they're not reproducing enough, and that has significant implications for the type of businesses that you can uh, run effectively selling to different age levels. 
Number six is changes in perception, mood, or meaning. Famous example is Airbnb. When they launched, some very smart VC said, this is a totally ridiculous idea. Why would you ever sleep over in some total stranger's home? They're probably an ax murder. But in fact, because everyone was online, it was relatively easy to build trust with total strangers and sleep over in their homes. Uh, and of course, at the same time, there's a massive real estate meltdown, which created a lot of excess real estate space. And that created an opportunity for Airbnb to become a very successful firm. The last opportunity is new knowledge, scientific and non-scientific. This type of opportunity gets a lot of buzz. Uh, people pay a lot of attention to it. But it's striking to me that this is only one of seven different ways that you can create new innovation opportunity um, because there are lots of things that have to happen before some new technology actually matters. So touch screens had been around for actually quite a long time, but it wasn't until the iPhone that it became really a mainstream technology. Same thing with solar cells. It took many decades for the price point to go low enough for them to meaningfully hit scale. So let's talk about alternative analyses. I'm not going to talk about alt data in general because we have lots of speakers at today's event who are going to go much deeper into it. But let's talk about some data sets that fewer people are looking at. So if you want to identify innovation, an easy way to do that is just look at what the VCs are doing because that's our job. And we're investing in private companies who are smaller than the playground in which the public market investors are typically playing. I've listed here some of the popular news sources that track the venture capital industry. Another tool is to identify and track searches and conversations and mentions across the web. A convenient website for this free is explodingtopics.com, which would have told you early that people were interested in plant-based diets in beauty fridges, which my daughter now wants to buy, uh, in massage guts. And that could have implications for you. Another tool is to look at app store rankings. This is also free. So here's a report from Zapier showing the fastest growing apps of 2019. Uh, some of these come from public companies like Facebook, uh, and that might have implications for their future. Another tool are online communities where technologists are evaluating products. Uh, for example, IT Central Station and some of the other companies that I list here are a good sense, a good opportunity for you to see what the real buyers are saying about competitive vendors in a given sector. I'm an investor in several alternative data companies, Earnest Research and Drop Technologies. And both these firms, in different ways, sell analyses and tools based on proprietary data sets, for example, of credit and debit card transaction data. Uh, that can obviously be highly predictive of earnings for companies whose revenues are driven by credit card and debit cards. And in a COVID world, people aren't using cash. So this is the overwhelmingly overwhelming form of revenue for a lot of businesses. I'm also an investor in Ask Wonder, which does custom research. Ask Wonder does research of any sort that you might do on Google. So the typical white collar worker spends tens of hours per week just looking up stuff online. And Wonder will do that for you. You can say, who are the new entrants in a given industry? Uh, what, why did a certain manager leave the company? And based on public data, they will help you identify the answers to that question. So the next source of information I'll talk about is your information network. In both public and private markets, I find there's a disproportionate value attached to verbal information, information that you're not getting in print because anything in print is relatively, relatively easy to commoditize, and your competitors likely have it. And that's one of the reasons for the expert network industry because it makes it easier to access individual industry experts. So I'm going to talk about some ways to identify experts and use them more effectively. First rule of intelligence gathering, when money changes hands, so does information. I used to be CEO of an expert network. And one of my learnings was there was a wide range of skill on how effective people were at elicitation, the process of gathering information from sources. I, I am specifically labeling this as elicitation to differentiate it from an interview, a job interview, for example, where you have a lot of power and people will generally tell you what you want. Interrogation, where you have even more power, for example, you're working for the police. In elicitation, you have to take a much softer approach. You have to build a relationship and trust to motivate people who may not care much about you to give you useful information. A common dynamic that I saw 
was I would introduce a 27-year-old analyst at a hedge fund to a 50-year-old ex-CEO, and after the call, the CEO would say, wow, that guy was rude and cocky and thought he knows it all because he works in Wall Street. And the analyst was getting less information from the source because they were not very good at elicitation. So I encourage you to double down on learning this skill set and contact me offline for some more resources on this. Um, one particular skill is you can't even elicit until you get people to return your calls. If you're using an expert network, no problem, right? The expert is paid to do it. But otherwise, if you're reaching out via sources, you have to figure out ways to motivate people to share with you. They're listening to radio station WIIFM. What's in it for me? So that might include affinity. Maybe you went to the same school. It might include reciprocal information. If you tell them you're doing in-depth research on a given sector, they're going to be motivated to speak because they recognize you're going to share with them some of what you've learned. You can also tap others' credibility. You can say, I interviewed XYZ other professionals in this sector. And it's always great to give a very targeted outreach. In other words, don't say, I'm doing research on auto. Say, I am doing research on the auto parts industry in Germany, and I noticed you wrote your doctoral thesis on this industry, and you're clearly one of the top experts in this domain. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak. That's a great way to start a call. Another way to identify potential domain experts, not to mention co-investors, are via online gated communities for investors. I've listed here some of the major communities for different categories of investors, all the way from early stage tech private company investors to public markets investors. These can be a good way to access information that may not be broadly available. This also applies to connecting with executives in your sector. I've listed here some ways to access senior industry execs in your space. I encourage you to go to LinkedIn, for example, and look for anything that is gated. Gated because you don't want to deal with the inexperienced people who are trying to get in and build connectivity with senior executives. But in most industries, there are certain gated groups which you might be able to engage with and benefit from online. Um, there are many others. These are just some platforms that might help you. Another way of identifying experts you can connect with without paying an expert network is via the biography analysis data providers. For example, ZoomInfo and BoardX and LinkedIn also serves this function. So sometimes the expert network may not turn up someone who's appropriate for you. This might give you a straighter route to a person with the right expertise. Then, of course, there are the expert networks. I've listed here some of the major providers who are happy to work with you. So let's talk about some next steps. One pattern that I've seen in where the best information is that is not broadly available is via your network, but it's not in your homogenous network. If you're a Ivy League grad sitting in New York uh, and you work for Goldman Sachs and you work for a hedge fund, that's great. That's a great credential, but a lot of industry looks just like you. And so I encourage you to think about who else you can build connectivity with who might be one degree away from you. Maybe they're in a different geography. They're sitting in San Francisco, so they're swimming in a different information pool. Maybe they're a different gender or ethnic background, and so they'll have a different perspective on, on things that are going on, uh, like the recent political events here in America. Um, and that will help to give you new exposure to insights you might not otherwise get. But if they're one degree away from you, they're similar enough to you that they'll speak your language and be able to help you um, to, to help relate to your particular situation. I'd also suggest building connectivity with, uh, in, if possible, live in person, if not virtually, uh, with the future leaders of your sector. So I've listed here some industry associations and conferences that are gated and are going to help build connectivity with senior industry executives in your space. Here's another list of people focused on policy, chance to build connectivity with people who are impacting policy, particularly important as we move towards an economy with a much more activist government. And here are a list of some learning programs. Think of them as miniature mid-career master's degrees that you might be able to participate in if you want to dive deep and build connectivity with industry leaders whom you might not otherwise get access to. 
I've listed here some others with more of an international flavor, for example, the Swiss American Young Leaders Conference or the U.S. Japan Leadership Program geared towards people who have particular interest in those geographies. There are the similar programs for most of the other established economies which you may be able to apply for and, uh, and gain connectivity from. I think that's particularly important in a quarantine world where it's much more difficult to travel um, to proactively make an effort to build connectivity with people in other geographies who can give you access to information on the ground that you could not readily get access to yourself because it might be much harder or even impossible to travel to certain geographies. Here I've listed some others, more of a U.S. focus of, initiative, of other mid-career miniature master's degree equivalents that you might find helpful for expanding your information network. So I'm uh, glad to participate in the conference. Feel free to email me or chat me. I've listed here my email, uh, Twitter, and website. And I welcome your questions and your feedback. I'm always looking to improve and gain further information. And I um, want to upgrade this presentation based on your input. So I'm excited to hear from you. Thank you very much. Take care.